Hey, everybody. I'm so glad you can all make it. Um, uh, as the introduction noted, I'm Ryan. As the introduction noted, I'm Ryan Lancio. Um, I'm based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. So uh, can do the cool thing where I point at my hand and say where I live. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about this technique that I've been using for a little bit for um, building front end applications. Um, and I'm going to share my screen now. All right. So uh, a couple things about me. I'm really into code and software, which you might guess by me being here. Um, really big into the developer community uh, in Ann Arbor. I help run the Southeast Michigan JavaScript meetup. It's one of the larger meetups in the area. Uh, kind of been pausing a little bit while um, pandemic's going on, but uh, looking forward to getting back into things uh, as we get moving. Uh, I am very much into coffee. Um, <laughs> when I give this talk in the morning at places, sometimes that elicits cheers from everybody. Um, and I'm really into music production, uh, or I used to be until um, <laughs> kids were involved. Uh, I have an amazing family uh, with four children and an incredible wife. This was at a ballet recital last year. We had a, another ballet recital this year, but it was a lot different. It was outside and uh, spaced for uh, social distancing, but it's something that uh, my kids are really into. Another thing that's really popular around this uh, time of year for our family is Halloween costumes. So uh, we kind of go all out making costumes. Um, here's a couple from previous years and kind of a spoiler for this year. Uh, we have Octacat. <laughs> the uh, Mario Kart, and then uh, the combined uh, Chell from Portal, uh, two, two kids win as, as one character. And then this year, you see we have uh, David Bowie and uh, the baby from the labyrinth. So fun times. I am very much into remote work. I am sure quite a few others are right now as well. Um, before everything, everything was remote, um, I've been doing remote work for about 10 years. Uh, one time, uh, my, a couple of my kids were home when my wife was away at an appointment while I was on a video call. It's not normally what happens, but my eldest is very, very conscientious about not interrupting when things are, um, on video calls. And, um, because she's so conscientious, uh, she kind of encountered a little bit of an emergency and uh, received this meeting while I was in the video or this email when I was in the, the meeting. Um, one of our other children was was still potty training and uh, kind of kind of needed some help. So did not expect to receive an email like that, but something that that cracks me up. But we're not here to talk about uh, me or my family so much. Uh, we're here to talk about software. We went around and you know looked in the chat and said, okay, what's your definition of good software? I think everybody would have a little bit different of uh, an opinion on what this might be, uh, where there might be some, you know, some debate about what's good software and what's not. I think we could all agree, however, that a lot of times we miss the mark of what our definition of good software is. So I love this quote. It's saying, hey, you know, a lot of times we build our software systems, our computer systems like these cities. And a lot of times um, if you visit old cities, you can see like, okay, here's the section of town that was built in this era. And, oh, and here's, you know, some modern buildings in that section for whatever reason. And, oh, over here, there's a cobblestone road, just uh, really getting into the legacy part of things. Uh, th this quote kind of resonates with me quite a lot. Uh, I don't know if you've all experienced this, but I certainly have especially in uh, some, of, some of like the more corporate jobs, you could see kind of where a different director came in to uh, take the reins on, on a project and kind of see the decisions that were made from a technological standpoint. And that comes with a lot of technical debt on occasion. Now, software is a relatively young field. Um, a lot of fields have been around for a while longer. And in these industries, there's strategies that they've been employed for hundreds or sometimes even thousands of years that help ensure success. I love this quote by Charlie Munger. Um, he's kind of associated a little bit with Warren Buffett. Um, 
but uh, not to talk about financial things, but this quote I think is, is very applicable to what we do as software developers. Um, you know, you can be a good thinker and just take good ideas from other things and figure out how to apply it to your field of interest, right? So one of the things that uh, I kind of like to do is um, cook at home, but I am not a professional chef. I've never worked in a professional kitchen. When I cook, it's, I make a mess of the kitchen. I'm kind of putting things in a pan just in time while I'm cooking another, a side dish. And uh, just kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, winging it. Now, when I'm building software professionally, I don't think winging it's a good, a good thing. So professional chefs use a couple different strategies that we're gonna look at today that might help us kind of avoid this thing where we're kind of winging things. So in one story, uh, there's a restaurant called American Bounty in New York and the chef, his entire kitchen staff just walked out and, you know, he's looking over his itinerary and it's like, okay, we've got a bunch of reservations coming up and, uh, oh, we're catering a banquet too. So I don't know about you, but I would be sweating a little bit in that scenario. Well, for chef Dwayne LaPuma, this was kind of an everyday affair. So this is from a book called everything in its place. And in this story, this is talking about the um, Culinary Institute of America. One of their training se uh, sessions for this program is they work at American Bounty. When um, the students are done with their session after a couple weeks or a couple months, they move on. But the strategies employed by the, um, the Culinary Institute, the chef is so um, convinced that they're fine that this does not cause him any trouble. When it comes to professional software, we should think more like a chef and less like a home cook. So what does that mean to think like a chef? I love this quote. We're gonna talk about mise en place. The system that make kitchens go is called mise en place or to put in place. So if you look at that book that we were talking about, it says everything in its place. This is a French phrase that means to gather and arrange the ingredients and tools needed for cooking. So this was popularized by a French chef named Escoffier. Now, I, I know my last name is very French, but I apologize to anybody who is fluent in French or is a native speaker. I've been told that I mispronounced my own last name. so. Um, if I pronounce his last name wrong, I apologize. But he is generally credited with popularizing mise en place. So um, he has a background in the military, and he's often credited with helping the French army withstand a, a siege. So, like you know, back in the day when cities were uh, under siege by other other countries, uh, his preparation and the the kind of steps he took to prepare food and kind of make sure everything was set up and ready to go, um, helped the French army kind of navigate that a bit better. I find it interesting that Adam Savage from like the Mythbusters and kind of the kind of making things, um, uh, kind of things instead of um, not necessarily related to, to cooking, he also refers to mise en place in his book, uh, Every Tool's a Hammer. So you see here, he's saying, this kind of corresponds to having our, our things prepared ahead of time so that when we're actually in the process of making things, we're ready to go. But it's more than this too. It's also a mindset. So you can see this quote here. It's a way of life. It's the way to be organized and a way to kind of rid yourself of distractions. In some cases I, I hear, um, that the people who kind of really, really embrace mise en place, they have their shoes super organized, their clothes super organized and everything organized like they would in a professional kitchen. But we're talking about software. What does this have to do with things outside of the kitchen, right? You know, we could talk a lot about mise en place and how it ap applies to professional cooking, but we're here to, to talk about code. Back to Adam Savage, he says, look, 
A maker in the workshop has similar stakes to those in the kitchen. The preparation is what makes the, the art of creating go together smoothly. So I, I would imagine that many of you recognize at least one of these logos, if not all of them. And this is kind of the, the frameworks and libraries that I see in a lot of professional applications today. One thing that these have in common, so between Angular, React, Svelte, and Vue, is we can think of our application as components. Components are awesome because they let, a, let us think about our application as specific applications in isolation. Before things like React and Angular kind of embraced this mindset of components, uh, there, were, there were some libraries and some strategies that people would employ to kind of think about an app as a series of smaller apps. But when these kind of took hold, that's when I really started to, to see that mindset really uh, kind of explode in, in the ecosystem. And I think, at least for me personally, I saw the, the quality of my code increased and other things went embracing components. So kind of the traditional to do MVC app, I'm sure many of you have seen this one before. If not, to do MVC is an application where people make a to-do list in multiple frameworks. We're not gonna focus on that part too much, but just kind of breaking this down into components, we could kind of say, okay, we have a header, we have an entry form, the various items that we have, and they can have a state of being checked off or not checked off, and then all the actions that we could take. Now, this is pretty simplistic. We could break this down further, but the, these are how we could break an application down into components. Unfortunately, there's a lot of times where we build, build our systems as just a, a, a list of components, and that doesn't uh, scale very well, especially on bigger applications. You bring new developers onto the team and it's like, you know, I have a components directory and I might have some folders in there, but there's not really any real organization into as far as how the components got there. There's a book by Brad Frost called Atomic Design. Uh, and I, I love this book. It is not about React or Angular or Vue. It is about design systems, more from kind of like the, the HTML and CSS side of things and even more of the design side of things. In his book, however, Brad kind of discusses this schema that he employs for building design systems. There's components called atoms, molecules, organisms, and templates and pages. So at the smallest level, a component would be an atom. A composition of, of atoms would be a molecule and so on and so forth. So I, I like to arrange things kind of using this mindset. A lot of times I'll start with atoms or base components and then um, patterns or composed components and then pages. I found on teams that I've kind of employed all five of these, um, people got confused over which kind of things belonged where. So I, I kind of simplify it by atoms and, and base items as one thing and then kind of a middle thing that's a composition and then pages which are a composition of the composed components and the atomic components. Does this sound familiar to what we we're talking about in the kitchen, however? So back to Adam Savage, we're talking about various components prepared ahead of time that help you put the dish together. So in this mindset, we're talking about the components that we, we've made in advance that set us up for success when we're building our actual feature pages or screens if we're building mobile applications. So we're gonna talk about design systems for a minute. Um, but actually, instead of design systems, um, we might, we might uh, kind of take a, a sidestep there and actually call them component libraries. Uh, some people joke that there's a bit of nuance between what's a design system and what's a component library. And I agree that there is a lot of nuance. Um, I think this take is pretty humorous on that. Um, but to avoid any confusion or saying that we're building a design system when we're actually not, um, we're going to call them component libraries. So like the chef in the kitchen, when they're using mise en place, they have different workspaces that they build parts of their meal uh, and assemble their meal individually as a series of parts. We're going to use uh, a tool called Storybook. Uh, 
Storybook works with React, Vue, Angular, um, and other libraries, and even just vanilla JavaScript, which is really nice. We can install Storybook by using NPX. It's a, NPX is kind of from the NPM tool chain. It allows you to run a CLI that you don't necessarily have on your computer. And um, we can initialize Storybook. There's other ways to install Storybook. This one's the most straightforward because it'll kind of run through the steps to set up Storybook as part of your application. And if we run Storybook, this would be Yarn Storybook or NPM Run Storybook, depending on the tools that we're using, um, we get something like this. Um, it, it sets us up with some initial stories. So kind of like that workspace we were talking about for professional chefs, Storybook can be the workspace where we build our components, where we apply mise en place to our application. For some of our talk, we're gonna assume that we're building kind of a social network for conferences. We have an activity feed and then some stuff along the side. We're only talking for about another half an hour here. So we're actually gonna simplify this a bit and just focus on the activity feed. If I were building this, uh, kind of employing these strategies that we're talking about, I would use Storybook to build the base components. And by base components, what I mean is we have you know, some, some similar things. We have some avatars, we have some text and some links and buttons. Uh, there's a couple more things than that. We have a card and a, and a list of cards, right? So in Storybook, we could similarly start with buttons, cards, links, and avatars. Now, you can build these from scratch, or you can start with a, with a toolkit that kind of helps get, get the ball rolling. Uh, there's a couple that are really popular right now, Tailwind UI from the creators of Tailwind CSS library. And this gives you a lot of starting points for building applications. Um, different than something like a, a Bootstrap or Bulma, but uh, some philosophies that, that overlap. But the nice thing is it gives you components to build your applications and you don't really have to think about them outside of kind of defining a theme. Likewise, there's a tool called Theme UI and a very, very similar one called Rebase. And so instead of building uh, things like our buttons as default buttons or our links and, and things like that as you know, kind of an abstraction of the HTML components, um, we could start by uh, including a button from, in this case, Rebase. Um, similar philosophies uh, if we were using Theme UI, um, and slightly similar even if we were using like Tailwind or, or others. Uh, Material UI is another good one. Um, but this gives us a lot of things out of the box. So we have a way to set background colors and colors and uh, margin things and padding. So that MB that you see the MB equals 30, um, that's referring to margin bottom. And then the rest of the props, if we're talking about React components. So we've talked about the components so far, um, but we're talking about storybook. How do we build our stories that kind of represent our UI? Storybook has uh, this uh, structure that we can use called component story format. And We'll talk about this a little bit more detail in just a second. But from the base level, we have an arrow function that represents a story, and we have some metadata. We're exporting our metadata as the default export, and we're exporting our, our story as this export const standard. So if we go back to Storybook um, for our card component, we'll have a story called standard for a uh, card. Now, Component story format, it's worth mentioning that if you look up Storybook, there was and still is a way that stories were crafted before component story format existed. So in this traditional story format, it was almost like a DSL where we were building like an, a chainable library to say, for my stories of card, if you look down towards the bottom here, um, we're going to add one called default and we're just returning a base card. We could continue to chain things with that add um, function, and we would get a series of, of different stories. 
But kind of looking back at component story format, um, this gives us a couple advantages just directly. Um, outside of knowing to export the, the object that has the title, um, which in this case we're using as a path or base slash card, um, we're, this is standard JavaScript. You know, we're, We have an arrow function where we're exporting uh, our components like we want it to render. This is using the React implementation, so we're using JSX, but this uh, similar philosophy for other uh, frameworks and libraries. So in this one, we have a folder for base, which if we look back at our title, we had title base slash card. On the left, we have a folder for base and then uh, a folder for card and a story called standard. And this matches kind of what we were expecting. So looking back at our activity feed, um, you know, we have our base components, that's all well and good, but we're actually trying to build something a little bit more uh, dynamic than just a component library that's only used for buttons and links and kind of the, the building blocks of an app. So what we can do is compose our base components. So once we have our base components or our atoms, if we're thinking of like the uh, atomic design kind of structure, um, we can, we can compose our base components. So for activity feed, we could have an activity feed item that consists of the card, the avatar, the text, and the link. Um, our function activity feed, which is our React component, takes in some props for name, the URL, conference name. Um, you see here for this avatar, I'm, there's an image URL that uh, I'm using here. Uh, if you're not familiar, this is a placeholder image that has site that has nothing but images of Bill Murray. It is pretty awesome, except if you're demoing to a client and forget to change it to something else. Um, I've done this before. Uh, it, it worked out well, the client loved it, but um, general, generally when I'm making stuff for me, I start off there and kind of change to a more realistic avatar. But uh, anyways, that's a, that's a side point. I, I appreciate that, that service. So we have our activity feed and we could build a story using our activity feed item. Kind of, kind of taking the same approach. We're exporting some metadata and then we're exporting an arrow function that uses our activity feed item. We can pass in the name and the conference name and the image URL, which corresponds to the props that we're expecting. And we get the following for our output in storybook. So you see, we started off with the smaller components and we're rolling them off into bigger components using storybook. So this is running on the side of our actual mainline application. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've been in, on a lot of uh, development teams where the testing would happen against a development version of the database. This is great, but this, using storybook, I found at least for me, provides faster feedback, which helps me move a lot faster. So using Storybook, this is one way that we can apply kind of this like mise en place mindset to our components. But there's some other really nice things that we can achieve through this too. So I like this quote a lot. Many people associate using this like mindset to ensure quality in a kitchen. So kind of focusing on parts of a meal individually help the people in the, in the kitchen achieve better results. Similarly, there's things that we can do to have better results um, with our code base if we use something like Storybook to, to build our components in isolation first. Storybook has a lot of different tools that we can use to, um, to kind of enhance our Storybook experience. Um, one of these tools that I really like to help ensure quality is uh, a plugin for accessibility. So accessibility is something that's super important on the web. And unfortunately, a lot of times we miss the mark as developers and providing a, a good experience on that front. It's something that, that's absolutely vital. Um, so if we install the accessibility plugin with Storybook, um, it doesn't give us like a full guarantee that our sites are accessible, but it helps us catch some of the low hanging fruit. So if we take this for an example, some of you might, might immediately know what's going wrong here. Um, we have this button. Uh, let's let's look at, really closely at the button. So, for those that don't know or didn't jump out at you, um, 
this text, the contrast ratio isn't uh, isn't very good. So uh, th this could cause issues for some folks to be able to actually see what the button is saying. Using this uh, accessibility plugin, we have a pane at the bottom where we're kind of seeing our, our plugins in use. And um, this one, uh, it calls out the problems at the component level. Like, hey, uh, you don't have the sufficient color contrast. This is using the ax tool behind the scenes to really make sure that things are um, call, things are being called out. Um, and you can run ax at the page level. Um, it's built into Chrome DevTools. But I found, at least for me, that kind of having it uh, all localized to the, the component level is really helpful. Um, there's a question right now. I appreciate the questions um, that, that's really applicable to this section. Um, so um, the question says, are you using Storybook as a prototyping tool or um, for some UX design up front, or do you think teams can actively develop their project uh, and deploy the, their components? Um, it could be either. I personally like to use it um, to, uh, to develop the projects. Um, so we'll, we'll see a little bit more uh, why uh, in, in just a second, but um, th there's some kind of benefits that we get from kind of keeping a storybook up to date. And one of those things is documentation. Um, but that's, that's a great question. And we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit more in a second. So kind of as we noted before, accessibility tools like this are helpful, but there's still other things that we need to do. And that's kind of outside the scope of this talk, but it, it is very, very helpful to kind of have that front and center when building components. One of the other ones that I really like is this viewport tool or viewport plugin. I've had a number of times in my career where um, we build a responsive website, but maybe the, the breakpoints aren't um, exactly the same as a, a key stakeholder's device. So we could have this perfect uh, responsive website, but on a very unique um, device uh, that might be the one owned by a stakeholder uh, doesn't, quite, uh, doesn't quite work as anticipated. So it's great, it's great feedback to have, but we can use this viewport plugin to kind of help us achieve uh, good results there. So um, kind of looking at uh, our storybook, um, you'll see right above the component, visualization, um, there's a, a tool that we're going to click on here. So um, we'll click. And we have different breakpoints that are set up. Now, these are configurable. These are kind of just the default ones. But we could we could set a number of different breakpoints. And at the component level, make sure that things are looking like they're supposed to. So the biggest thing for me that um, outside of having a workspace to build our applications from is Storybook unlocks some nice benefits for, for testing. And that might sound kind of weird that we have this you know, UI layer that we're, or this UI application that we're you know, manually clicking around our, our app or our components and, and saying, does this work? Does this not work? But remember, our stories are um, arrow functions that also look like React components in this case. So here's two stories. Um, this one is using our activity feed item. We have one for Bill Murray and another one for Nicolas Cage. So kind of like that Phil Murray website, there's also a place cage placeholder image service. Um, so we have two different stories here that we're exporting. We can go back to storybook and see we have our activity feed items with Bill Murray and with Nicolas Cage. The only thing that's different between the two uh, is that URL. But now for our testing, uh, I really like this library called React Testing Library for testing applications. Uh, it works for Angular and some other things as well, um, things like Cypress. But um, in this example, we're looking at the React Testing version. Um, and you see, instead of actually, like, in a lot of applications I've seen, you know, people are building this like render element for test or rendering the elements directly in each of their tests. Here, we're importing our stories. So if we look back, you know, we have the two stories that we're building, the Bill Murray and Nicolas Cage ones. We're importing those stories and rendering those directly as the thing that we want to test. So if you see here, we're testing that, hey, there's one that has Bill Murray and one that has Nicolas Cage. This is really nice because when unit tests fail, there's ways to debug why the unit test might be failing. But when something uh, 
has a visual component to it. Um, being able to say, all right, my test is failing. I don't know why I can fire up storybook and run through these same tests or these same steps that my test is running through. Um, it really helps. Um, so kind of, kind of to go back to the, the, the awesome question I had before. Um, I do think it's great to have storybook actively as part of the development cycle. Um, and this is one of the primary reasons why you almost get your stories for free if you embrace it as part of your testing. So one of the, the downsides I've seen to storybook when it's not used in concert with testing is a lot of times people will use storybook when they're initially building their app. And then once it's been running for six months to a year or whatever, storybook kind of gets, uh, kind of gets out of date. So when it's treated as part of the unit testing, it uh, pays for itself at that point. And then you have the added benefit of, you know, it serves as documentation. You can kind of rapidly prototype some things in storybook kind of to help facilitate discussion. Um, but then it's always kept up to date if it's part of the tests. So how do we, so let's say we have an existing application. How do we kind of switch to using a component library? There's an awesome book by Ala Komaltava um, where the discussion says, okay, we should start with the purpose of the components and find anything where um, th th there's a shared purpose and then kind of define out those, those building blocks and then the, the patterns that are like the composition components. And then there's some consensus if there's, especially if there's a lot of developers that are gonna be building this component library or working in this component library, kind of agreeing on what means, what means an atomic component versus a composed component or the things that we find important. There's, there's gotta be an agreement there. Um, there's a lot more to it. Uh, URLs on kind of the, the bottom of this here and I can, I can share the links as well. But, um, but kind of the, the main thing that I like to do is say, figure out what, what uh, elements as part of like the pages in the, in the application or the screens in the application, which elements share a purpose. And those are good candidates for um, making components and building, you know, a component library out of. But one thing that's important is it's generally a good idea to only start abstracting components when they're being repeated over and over again. So if I'm using a component in an existing system only on one screen, I'm probably not going to make that a reusable component. Um, it's already working in place and there's not much value in kind of making it something reusable until it needs to be reused. Uh, I love this quote right here from Sandy Metz. Um, this is I know this is in some of uh, Sandy's talks, but um, it's also in uh, a Ruby book, which isn't something that normally comes up in front end conversations, but she has a, a book called Practical Object Oriented Design with Ruby. Um, very, uh, very, very good book. I recommend it to everybody, even if they don't see themselves programming in Ruby, but duplication is cheaper than the wrong abstraction. And I think that kind of pushes that mindset that we're talking about that, um, we, we want to make sure that we're not building an abstraction before we need it, where the abstraction is a component in this case. Another thing that uh, kind of outside of the storybook realm that I think is really helpful that we can learn from the, the cooking sphere um, is a lot of people are proponents of using a checklist um, when, when making things. So this quote here, um, all operations should have a checklist to work from. This is from the Culinary Pro. There's a book by Atul Gawande called The Checklist Manifesto that is very, very eye-opening um, where he kind of covers this. Um, he's a, a surgeon and he worked with the World Health Organization and kind of figuring out how to decrease fatalities in surgeries uh, across the world. And kind of trial and error through a lot of different things. One of the things that um, he kind of came up with is we need a checklist and this checklist will actually cut deaths and um, injuries tremendously from surgery. It was something like 36% uh, less um, injuries and 43% less fatalities just from implementing a five-step checklist. And I think uh, in software, it's, it's uh, similar. So a couple of different strategies that we can use. One of the things that I really like is a, a PR template checklist. Um, so uh, this is something kind of outside of CI, but just kind of things to say when I'm, when I'm opening up a PR on my team, uh, there's a, a number of things that I want to make sure I, I've personally checked off before I, I take somebody else's time reviewing my PR. So, um, this is, this is one that, uh, I liked from, from the internet. Um, 
but just kind of some things to say, you know, look, I've done these things. I made sure these, uh, these steps have occurred before, before opening a PR. Um, and kind of, kind of in line with the checklist manifesto stuff, it seems at first glance to be a little insulting. Like, yeah, of course I've performed a self-review on my own code. But a lot of times, if I am honest with myself, uh, I see my codes working and I, my unit tests pass, and then it's kind of like, okay, check it in. Um, and uh, a lot of times I do self-review my own code, but it kind of helps avoid those scenarios where I don't. Another thing that I like for um, this kind of like checklist idea or to-do list idea is actually creating a to-do list. So if I'm working on a feature, I like to make some initial commits and some initial um, headway on, on you know, some of the effort of the, the feature, but, um, but kind of open up a PR pretty, pretty quick in that process and then kind of put my steps of what's gonna happen as uh, features, uh, as the development on that feature occurs. So um, this has a couple different things that's really helpful, a couple aspects. Um, one of them is it serves as communication. So sometimes I can open up a PR um, and I have that, that to-do list and um, it can both communicate to my team kind of where a feature stands outside of kind of like, you know, the, the stand up or the Slack uh, conversations. Um, but also um, it also serves as a little bit of like design. And if uh, a team embraces this kind of thing, um, you know, there can be some initial review on this to-do list where another, another developer might say, oh, wait, what about this? Have you thought about this? Uh, so it's really helpful, um, but then it also helps me just collect my thoughts as well. So um, I found it really interesting, like Leonardo da Vinci even had to-do lists and his was, um, the, the one that I saw from him was pretty pretty uh, much on a different level from the ones that I do. Like he wanted to measure the, the land mass of one of the, the cities in Italy and, and things like that. So it's a little bit more than, than what I'm talking about here, but I, I find it really helpful and seeing that people who are very, very smart uh, use to-do list too, I think is uh, encouraging as well. So kind of kind of uh, just a, a super demo version of, of what I mean by that is here's just kind of a, a to-do list and, and a pull request. And um, now, now we even have draft PRs, which is really helpful. So kind of start, start the work, check it in, make my to-do list or make my to-do list first, but make it as part of the, the PR process where that becomes visible. All right, so another thing that's, that's really helpful from kind of the culinary world that I think we can employ as well. Um, so we've been talking about like, like fine dining and, uh, and things like that. And this is kind of a little bit outside of the, the, the like culinary arts world, but there's still a lot of uh, cool things going on in fast food. Um, so with McDonald's, for instance, they closed down their restaurant. They, um, way, way back when they were initially starting, they had a, a restaurant that was pretty successful, but, um, the people who ran it closed it down and, and made a, a streamlined service for assembling food. Um, and I like this quote kind of in more computer science realm where we say, you know, there's some things that computers can do better than people um, or it can do at better scale than people. And that's, we, we should absolutely um, kind of shift that uh, responsibility to the computers where that makes sense. And I don't mean that as in like the computer took my job kind of thing, but more as like, in like the Tony Stark uh, philosophy where, hey, the computer helps me have superpowers kind of thing. And one of the things that I do on a lot of projects uh, is make a custom CLI for the project. Um, I'm in React a lot. And so there, there are other frameworks that actually have a CLI that's really, really good. Um, here's Angular, for instance. Um, some of the other front end tools have CLIs that are pre-built. Um, there's some community um, CLIs that are also very good. Um, but one of the things that I've done for projects in the past is I would build my custom steps. Um, so like, let's say I was building a component and it was an atom or I had, you know, an atom or a composed component or pages. Um, I could script that all out into something where if I said, you know, create a component and I want a story and I'm using style components and I want, you know, I want separate files for all these things. Um, so here we could uh, see one that's kind of a, an example of one. Now this varies from development team to the development team, but, um, but creating a CLI with some of these tools, um, this one's glue gun. Uh, it's powered some, some of the like AWS amplify tools at one point and, uh, a lot of, a lot of different things, um, by this is a tool by infinite red and it's really a pleasant experience for building a, a CLI. 
but um, it's not much of a as much of overhead as it used to be to build a CLI with some of these tool, uh, tools that we have at our disposal. So this this kind of thing where it's like I'm building uh, a component and I have these different steps that I take. If I script that out through a CLI, that's something that I never have to think about again. And instead of um, having it documented to say, you know, when you're building a component, you need this file, this file, and this file. Instead, if you say, when you need a new component, run this command, uh, that, that's less cognitive overhead as well. And kind of our, our ch checklists and to-do lists kind of work in concert with this uh, philosophy of automation that they kind of can illuminate some things that we might be missing and some things that we might be able to automate. So I really appreciate that. So when should we avoid these strategies? So when should we avoid kind of like building a, a workspace and kind of embracing this uh, strategy where we have different areas for different types of components and different types of screens? Um, one of the things I always recommend, um, and, and I do this myself when I'm building something just kind of as a test application or as a one-off application, um, that's kind of one of the areas where I would say, let's not, um, but let's, let, let's not go uh, down this path where we're including a storybook and, and scripting things out and, uh, and, and doing all these things where the value that we're trying to get is more to test if something's gonna work, um, might not make much sense. I kind of, or something where I don't wanna scale. So I don't have a development team that, um, that's going on, that's gonna be using this into the future. Um, that, that's kind of um, where I would avoid that. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, really appreciated the opportunity to talk with you all. Um, so I can take any questions. Um, we've got a couple minutes left here, or we can chat um, over Twitter. Uh, my, my Twitter handle is at the top right. Um, so if you can spell my name, you can find me on, on, if you can spell my name, you can find me on Twitter. So thank you, everybody. Um, so a great question came in um, in regard to the CLI tool, uh, the component file uh, uh, and story ended up in the same folder. Uh, would you recommend kind of this structure, more of a, a structure um, to hold all components and all things? So kind of, if I understand the question correctly, um, should things be organized by feature or by technology is kind of how I'm uh, kind of seeing that question. Um, and that's, that's kind of a, a question that depends on preference for, you know, you or your team or whoever. Um, I personally love kind of uh, organizing things by feature. Uh, there's a, another kind of talk or um, uh, another kind of a blog post that <laughs> this, that we could, this could be an entire different talk about organizing things by feature. I'm a big proponent of that, but it's not necessary. Um, and so kind of saying, you know, building a CLI is a very personal to your team's workflow decision. Um, I think that's kind of another one of those. So great question. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, if any other questions come up, uh, feel free to message me on Twitter and really appreciate uh, you being here. <laughs>